We're going to wait a few more minutes as everyone comes back from lunch. Um, so I said, I'm just going to you can start whatever you want, but people will start. You can start whatever you want. Well, now that everyone's quiet, how are you doing? See, but we can't run too late because otherwise we won't No, it's up to you on your account. <laughs> Yeah, I think I'll probably just move it. Yeah, close. Also, the buffer of this is workshop summer. We don't need it. We can have a walk over there. It can be summarized in two words. It was good work. No, no, I'm serious. Slide number three will convince you that I don't need anything else. <laughs> because the way how you say it, it's exactly what I'm trying to say. You want to teach it anymore. <laughs> I know, it's innocent, you actually meant something else, but the way how you say it. Yes. <laughs> you also, you also. It's not sign problem, it's not a problem. We take to play the same game as Martin was Martin. So if only assume that only simple signals are allowed for getting the data, then we don't have a problem. <laughs> yeah, if it's just one of the and to call data, yeah, sure, we can do it. No other definition problem. <laughs> It's in the in the town. So between us, it's probably uh, two miles. Yeah. <laughs> two miles. Sometimes, not frequently. <laughs> So, hello everyone. Um, thanks for coming to the last session, and uh, we're excited to have our first speaker, uh, Nikolai Prokofiev. Disillusion us about the fermion sign problem. And I'll yeah. finish five when it's five with four. Yeah. And I feel I have to do it because so many times during this workshop I had something which was called fermions have a sign problem. So I have to kind of fight against the statement. <laughs> and I'll just try to prove, okay, and I will be using Martin as a typical experimentalist. <laughs> he, he is highly atypical. Yeah. So let me first kind of uh, mention all the collaborators with whom this work was done. Well, different pieces, maybe only one or two slides, but nevertheless. So it's a voice system of an Igor Pipitsen from University of Massachusetts Amherst. Eugene Deng is our collaborator from China at USDC in Hefei. Ricardo Rossi is now at the Center for Computational Quantum Physics at Splatiron Institute. Chris Van Kuk and Felix Werner from EMS in Paris, and also Jenny Kozik and Fyodor Simkovich from the King's College London. And Fyodor is moving to Econama, uh, Econ Polytechnic. So essentially, I will be trying to convince you, or kind of to push forward, 
that if I can see the interacting fermions, more or less standard translational invariant Hamiltonian, but that's what I mean, you can assume any dispersion relation, any number of bands you want, you can assume any type of two-body interactions, any range, any coupling between the bands, you can add three-body interactions if you like, but that's what I'm considering typical interacting fermions. Okay? So for this Hamiltonian, and that's all I need to convince you, that fermions don't have a sample. Because if you take a voltmeter, and ask an experimentalist, do they have a problem? They don't have a problem. They just measure properties of electrons. So electrons don't have a problem. So whenever you say that, okay, fermions have a sign problem, that's already wrong. <laughs> and the majority of you uh, know this in a hard way. You just do the experiments. But if you use fermions, then they don't have a problem. Yeah. <laughs> so if, whenever you say, okay, well, there is some fermionic sign problem, it's not fermions have a sign problem. There is a fermionic <laughs> sign problem. It does exist, but it's human invented, and it's only depending on the method. Yes, you can do things in such a way that you have a sign problem, but you can do things another way when there is no problem. <laughs> and more or less, this is my conviction, so just I'll try to kind of slowly prove it, that it's my personal point of view that at least at the level of standard, standard dynamics, because we have much smaller pool of examples, at least at the level of dynamics, but if you can measure it experimentally, we can do the same accuracy for the same system on a classical computer. You probably still remember Obama. He was saying, okay, yes, we can, but. <laughs> <laughs> so there is, there is a small but which is saying, okay, I am claiming the solution does exist, but in most cases we don't know what it is. Which means <laughs> the technique is there, but it will require some analytic thinking, fine-tuning to the Hamiltonian, and if you do the proper qualitative job analytically, then probably you'll be able to do the right job quantitatively. But otherwise, I would say there are no limitations. So for this type of Hamiltonian, you can solve it just as good as experiment experiments can be done. Okay, let me try to kind of introduce one small notion, which is based on the question which was asked by David separately, but that's the most relevant one. He was saying, okay, well, stop talking about you know, some problems which are method-specific, so suppose I ask a different question. Whether a particular method can achieve a given accuracy in a thermodynamic limit system, and how long does it take? That's the practical question, the most relevant one. And this leads me kind of to something which I have to define in a more precise term, so I just convince you that, okay, there is a computational complexity problem, and it relates to the question, okay, how long I have to compute something to achieve a given accuracy. So you specify your quantity in a thermodynamic limit. You specify your, say, relative accuracy. And then you ask a question, okay, if I start making this relative accuracy better, better, and better, how much longer I have to run my computers just to, to achieve this accuracy? So this is the relevant question. So if this time is polynomial, we just say that computational complexity problem is solved in a given method. If this time is not polynomial, but for example, log t will scale as 1 over epsilon, maybe to some power, we say, okay, it's exponentially bad. Take this, remove the log, and this will go to the exponent. And essentially, it's impossible to keep improving accuracy because you will you know, go to accuracy twice as good, and suddenly from one year you go to the time of the universe, so it's a hard wall. So if it's polynomial, we call it solved. Otherwise, the computational complexity problem is not solved. So that's the working definition of computational complexity. Well, why I'm talking about thermodynamic limit? Because academically speaking, if you take finite size system M, Nicolas, you have to put one extra log on the right hand side yeah. here that you shouldn't have. Sorry, which one? Uh, log TQ is log epsilon. I think you mean epsilon minus one. Yeah. You mean log on both sides? Yeah, so it's, poly it's polynomial function. That's what I mean, it's polynomial function. Ah, to be solved. Yeah. To be solved, it has to be a log versus log, which means it's some polynomial function. That's why I don't have to specify the prefect. Yeah. Well, why I'm talking about thermodynamic limit? Because academically speaking, if you take finite size system, and if you long wrong, you long enough, so there will be some typical time scale when you reach 100% accuracy, which you barely know the answer. But uh, whatever you do further will improve your accuracy as one of epsilon squared. That's just a central limitation. The moment you sample all the relevant configuration space and you answer more or less settled with 100% accuracy, the rest will be 1 over epsilon squared. That's the central limitation. There is nothing you can do. But this prefactor, before this starts, it may happen that, okay, well, this tau of n can be exponential function of n. And the moment you start talking about thermodynamic limit, everything breaks. You will never reach 100% accuracy in the first place. So that's sometimes kind of is hidden. 
And let me kind of explain this a little bit, which is typically not discussed in the kind of even the standard discussion of sign problem. Typically people say, oh, sign problem is exponential on the system size. No, sign problem is never exponential on the system size in the first place. So let me explain. Without finite size scaling, strictly speaking, you cannot even define how it will depend on the system size. Because remember, I want to compute something with a given accuracy. <coughs> Maybe I have a method such that the prefactor, before I start seeing epsilon squared, goes as exponential e to power n beta. This is not your problem yet, for very simple reason. You specify the quantity, you specify the accuracy, and, but I have to tune how big the system I need to ensure that finite size scaling is smaller than your epsilon. Because it would be crazy if I try to compute a system which is much bigger than required. You already gave me some epsilon, why would I make my finite size corrections a factor of 100 smaller? It's totally unreasonable because I already settled on a given error by epsilon. So you will fine tune the system size to the required accuracy. And from this you understand immediately that, well, okay, you have to construct the finite size scaling plot, if available. Then you have to specify your accuracy. Then you will determine your system size for this particular accuracy. And then you can start the simulation. It would be totally impossible to do it here. Yes, finite size correction is much smaller than the accuracy you want, but you will never reach even 100%. You will just start somewhere here because of this exponent. So even in the conventional method, where you have this prefactor scaling as exponential in M, the sign problem will depend on finite size corrections. But the global statement is, under those conditions in, say, generic three-dimensional system, <coughs> yes, your computational complexity problem will suffer, and you will hit a wall, which means the scaling will be log t is some <coughs> polynomial in one over epsilon. So this will be exponentially hard to improve accuracy if you have this type of problem. How do you know the finite size? For this, you have to be lucky enough that you can compute systems somewhere here, so you are on the scaling curve. But it may happen that you even here, the required computation time is so hard that you cannot even construct the curve. Also happens. Well, suppose you want to do 64 fermions, and under certain conditions, this will not be even possible. But you say, can I start finite size scaling from system size 4? Maybe not. So you have to be lucky even to have this curve as well. But let me kind of forget about this, because this is not about diagrammatic Monte Carlo. So there is diagrammatic Monte Carlo, which actually is doing thermodynamic limit right away from the formulation of the problem. So if I can see the only connected Feynman diagrams, I already do thermodynamic limit system. Well, it immediately, OK, the technique, more or less, everybody knows. You have your answer. You express it in terms of connected Feynman diagrams. So you have some Taylor series, maybe in the coupling constant, maybe in some auxiliary parameter that's separate. Well, I can normalize everything by the convergence radius if I have one. And then you have, I know, this type of Taylor series when you expand in powers of some <laughs> dimensionless parameter g. When g is 1, you hit the convergence radius. Okay? So that's why I normalize by the convergence radius, assuming it does exist. Okay? So that's the assumption that you do Taylor series and maybe they will be here. Well, the coefficients themselves you compute by stochastic sampling, for example. You can sum up all through topologies. Maybe you do stochastic sampling only in the space of variables. And this is just the standard Feynman diagram in whatever is the presentation you like. So this you do by Monte Carlo. You compute those coefficients. And then you recover your quantity from the Taylor series. So that's the setup. First, let me explain. This fermionic sign problem doesn't apply here in principle because first, your answer is already in a thermodynamic limit. So whatever previously was called fermionic sign problem was exponential scaling with the system size. There is no system size here in principle. It's already infinite. So you cannot apply the conventional notion of fermionic sign problem. It's not even there. So that's one. Well, second, those series potentially have finite convergence radius only under one condition. They have to be for fermions. And this happens because factorial number of different topologies, they cancel each other to nothing. So convergence can emerge only because diagrams cancel another, each other. So your only hope that all of this will work nicely is because you have sign blessing one. Diagrams cancel each other. So you need sign for this to work better. Well, and second kind of sign, which is increasing for fermions, we call it sign blessing two, if you like. This is something which is even more technical, but it tells you that even connected Feynman <coughs> diagrams can be computed much faster than the factorial, which means there is intrinsic structure for fermions, <coughs> how connected Feynman diagrams are organized, and they contain pieces of determinants. 
But the tenant is again based on the fermionic sign. You swap two lines places and you pay fermionic sign for it. So because of the sign you can have convergent series and because of the sign you can perform the summation of all topologies much faster than factorial. Okay? But I, I thought that in systems that are generically already in, in methods that are generically in the thermodynamic limit like this, then you should think of the sign problem as um, exponential in the size of operators you need, which means in, in the in beta, right? Because as you go to lower and lower beta... We don't suffer. Uh, we don't suffer at lower and lower temperatures just per se. Well, if it's a Fermi liquid regime, nothing will happen at lower and lower temperatures. Everything will separate except the Cooper channel. But you can treat the Cooper channel cleverly, and then you are perfectly OK. Yeah. So if you compute the proper reducible coupling, at very low temperatures, it's as good as just low, a little bit low temperature. Yeah. But if there is an instability to something you don't know, then... If you don't know it, probably you'll see that you are hitting the convergence radius. Yeah. And then you start analyzing your series, and maybe you will deduce what's hurting you. Yes, I'm saying it's not black box. But you have all the tools to analyze what's happening. And yes, you have to tune your senses. Qualitatively, you have to understand everything analytically. This would be best. <coughs> you finish the job quantitatively. But you are prepared for uh, different instabilities to which channels you have to look. Maybe if you are not prepared, you will simply suffer from bad convergence. And then you have to think more. But that's the setup. So essentially, if sign problem, fermionic sign problem, definitely doesn't apply here in principle. So it's not even on the screen. Well. The fermionic sign problem doesn't work for diagrammatic Monte Carlo, but we can ask, okay, well, what about the computational complexity? And now I just, well, finish everything. This, it's trivial proof. It's, well, my approximation to the thermodynamic limit answer will be simply to computing a finite number of terms in the Taylor series. But if my Taylor series converge, then my approximation is getting exponentially better when I go to larger n. And if you give me some accuracy, I will simply go to n large enough that the corrections are smaller than epsilon. Well, it immediately tells you that, OK, g to power n versus accuracy says that n has to be log in epsilon. And the last equation, OK, well, you have to be sure that the computation time required to, con to construct those Taylor series is exponential. But that's what was given by the algorithm, which was developed by uh, Ricardo Rossi, that yes, you can go through the sum of all connected topologies in exponential time. And you can kind of check numerically if you like, but this is more or less already proof, that you can finish the job of computing Taylor series in exponential time. Well, your accuracy gets exponentially better if you go to larger n, and computational time goes exponentially longer. Exponent versus exponent is a power. Just substitute here n, which is the log of epsilon, you will end up with log t, which is log 1 of epsilon. So the grammatic Monte Carlo solves computational complexity. It doesn't suffer from the sign problem. You need sign for convergence. And the moment you get convergence, you can improve your accuracy in polynomial time. So OK, let me show you how this works in practice when it's easy. So when Taylor series do converge, so that's the example. It's 2D fermi hubbard model, not very large U. That's why I'm inside the convergence radius. Temperature is, well, somewhat lower than we have in experiments. Density is 0.875. You can get the equation of state in this sense, well, it's just free energy density, but I'll call it pressure. So you can get almost six digits right by going to diagrams up to the 11. That's now doable. And I think that even with bosonic codes, which we typically say don't suffer from anything, it's just the glory of bosonic Monte Carlo by path integrals, just good luck to get six digit accuracy <laughs> on some standard thermodynamic property. You'll have to run for months and months. Diagrammatically, you can get the accuracy. Yes, I agree. It's not very strongly correlated, but yeah, but otherwise there is no other method which will give you the same accuracy. If you want, you can use it for benchmark for any other method to reproduce. Okay? So you can get it if you have convergence. Are those just statistical error bars or are you uh, this is mostly yeah, statistical because I'm not even extrapolating. The series can emerge and that's why okay, I'm not even showing up to uh, six. Of course if I go further it's just I don't know much, much bigger in amplitude. So this is already the tail and you see the tail is already in the six digits. It's without any extrapolation, so this is purely statistical. Of course, while there are other answers, you immediately say, OK, this is boring because it's converging. But the more or less the global statement, I will not kind of prove it because I don't have time. I'll just illustrate it by pictures, roughly what we mean. The answer is, if you have enough terms in the Taylor series and enough analytics, and you know how to manipulate those Taylor series, 
you, you can achieve a QDC which goes exponentially with the diagram, or the almost under all conditions. But you have to be very clever how you do it. So I'll just illustrate it. So suppose, just it's a trivial example. Suppose you want to know your answer the star, and you are outside of convergence radius because you have a pole. Everybody knows what to do. You say, okay, remove this pole by conformal mapping. It express Taylor series in U as Taylor series in Z, and you will be well inside convergence radius, and you'll get exponential accuracy. You say, how do I know that I have a single pole here, say, of first order? If you have enough Taylor series, just call your parameter complex number, plot the argument of your function as a function of everywhere in the complex plane, you'll see that phase starts running like crazy around this point. I'm not saying that from finite number of terms you determine the point exactly, of course not. But approximately is okay, because all you need is to be well inside the convergence radius. I don't have to put this really to infinity. It has to be just far enough, and everything will work. And of course you recognize here that okay, one pole first order, that's trivial, but if you have any number of poles of any order, you do so-called PADE resummation. So the ultimately PADE is exactly the conformal map which moves all singularities to infinity as the ratio of two polynomials. Okay, so that's the generalization for any number of you know, point-like poles of any order. So people know how to do it for any number of branch cuts. It's a generalization of Padere using the ratio of hybrid geometric functions. This was also used. And most beautifully, it was, was used actually for dynamics by Olivia Porcalier. So this kind of for 40 years, people were trying to so maybe less. Non-equilibrium on the problem, and he solved it by diagrammatic Monte Carlo with proper kind of conformal mapping. The problem is now solved. For any time, for any U, you have very good answers. From Taylor series up to order 12. Okay, so if you have finite convergence radius, more or less you have generic techniques which allow you what to do. So let me explain some other tool. This is, is just an illustration. Is yeah. there any danger of more? No, you have more, more complex, more difficult structures. Yeah, that's what I'm going. Well, sometimes you can also use another tool. I'll just illustrate it vaguely. Suppose you outside of convergence radius. You say, okay, yeah, but it's only if I do expansion from the origin, I'm outside. But if I change the origin of expansion somewhere here, so my expansion parameter is now different. It's not you counting from the origin, it's something else. Maybe I'm inside the convergence radius. Change your expansion point. You say, how easily you can do? The answer is an infinite number of ways. So this is an illustration how you can do a so-called shift by changing the expansion point at the level of the Green's function. So you have this action, you have bare Green's function and interactions. You can write it down identically as any single particle propagator you like. It can even break, I know, causality. I don't care, because it's arbitrary function. And I will use it as a starting point. And I will write down a certain number of counterpoints. This is arbitrary function, arbitrary function, arbitrary function, <coughs> psi times the same interactions. And I need only one constraint. For psi equal one, artificial G tilde, plus all the counter terms together, that's my G0 minus one, and I have exactly the same answer when Xi is one. Now I can do Taylor series in Xi. And Xi is in front of interactions and the counter terms. And I can write it down in infinite number of ways at the level of the single particle Green's function. Once you use Hubbard's Hubbard's transformation, you now can do the same at the level of particle particle, particle holes, screening channels, all of them together. You can do this type of shifts in all of the channels. And you can start your expansion from a different point. So all the tools are available, barely used. So one tool which was already used for the Hubbard model, just more or less to achieve the same, is shifting the chemical potential. It's the easiest shift you can imagine, but you simply do expansion starting from a different density if you shift the chemical potential. And it works. Sometimes you're outside of convergence radius, change the expansion point by shifting the chemical potential, you're inside the convergence radius. This was also used, it's kind of, Antoine is here, so he was the co-author. And you can really achieve, I know, much better convergence properties just doing the chemical potential, but you have many more tools to play it in infinite number of ways. And this is kind of the final glory, kind of especially in this audience. It's the resonance Fermi gas. We did the first calculation a little bit naive, but well, ultimately we found that if I take the unitary Fermi gas, especially for infinite scattering length, well, that if you do skeleton diagrammatic series the way how we do them, we find that our coefficients are supposed to diverge as n factorial to power one fifth. So in this case, you say, if you have zero convergence radius, just give up. Well, the answer is, if you're clever enough, probably I have to accelerate a little bit. So if you're clever enough, there is a technique how to figure out what is hurting you. 
Because if you have daily series, the first, say, 10 or 12 terms, it's a polynomial, it's hundreds. So the whole trouble comes from infinite n behavior, from very large orders. And that's what Lipatov more or less told us in the 70s how to do. At least at the level of the partition function, you have to do functional integral. Well, but you, you can use Cauchy formula to understand the coefficient of expansion. So the coefficient of expansion, Zn, can be written as a you know, Cauchy integral. And then you simply raise g to power n plus 1, assuming that n is very, very large, to the exponent. Of course, if I have fermions, well, that's what he was doing. He said, OK, ultimately, you have to perform integration over the coupling constant and functional integral over the Grassmann fields. But something in the action looks like large. The only problem, of course, with fermions, there is no large, because you have Grassmann variables. So you have to do some type of hubbard tetanovic transformation, integrate out fermions. You end up with classical fields. Now you can use, uh, you can use saddle point approximation for the large classical action. And then you kind of compute the leading behavior of those coefficients. So that's what was done by the Paris group. And that's the outcome. So this is the equation of state for the resonant Fermi gas. We are pretty close to the transition temperature to superfluidity. So superfluidity starts roughly around 0.16. And this is temperature, which is 0.2 in terms of Fermi energy. So it's strongly correlated states. And then the cube is kind of the degeneracy parameter, the boil wavelength cube times density. Well, this is the diagrammatic Monte Carlo calculation using this knowledge, which kind of came from Lipatov. In this case, you have two branch cuts coming to the origin. But then you do conformal barrel and just the rest of the machinery. But it's guaranteed that it gives you a unique answer, and that's the answer. <coughs> Eventually, at this point, we are just trying to reconcile with Martin how well he can reduce now his. Those are the previous MIT experiments. So that's the previous error bar, and this is our previous error bar. Perfect agreement within error bars. But now the error bar has gone down by a factor of 10. So if the experiment goes down by a factor of 10, so this would be the challenge of okay, how well we agree. But that's roughly the level of comparison you can do for the strongly correlated Fermi system at low temperatures close to something which is already a superfluid transition. So this level of accuracy is possible. Just give us more terms in the daily series, we'll tell you what to do. Would so, this work across the entire transition? Uh, I, no, no, it will work only up to PC. Maybe we can get closer to PC a little bit. But then we'll see the divergence in the pair correlation function, but we'll start fitting it to the known universality class. We cannot cross the transition. Behind the transition, we have to reprogram the broken phase. So the current code can work only for the normal state. We cannot cross the transition point. So this will be something which is divergence, but on the axis of interest. This is not resumable. So you have to change the diagrammatic expansion and do expansion in the superfluid phase if you want to understand properties of the superfluid. So at each order, we know what the diagrams are actually? Absolutely. I mean, you, you can actually draw them out. No. Uh, I, can, I can do it only for orders 1, 2, 3. Yeah, 1, 2, 3. At order 9, at order nine there are 40 million of them, yeah, so I give it. But you know, you know exactly what diagrams are. Because I thought you They are generated stochastically. I don't even have to know what they are. But I know that I cover them ergodically without missing any. Are you also stochastically sampling the yeah, integration yeah. points? And okay, in the long, very bad codes, we stochastically sample the configuration space of topologies. But after Ricardo Rossi, uh, essentially, I know, the paradigm has changed. You can't sum through all the topologies in one update. So update is now between the variables only. Topologies <coughs> can be summed. Because factorial number of topologies can be done in exponential time. You'd better sum them up. So this is like on, this a, is the laptop, on a laptop, like in a millisecond? Or? No, no, no. <laughs> no, well, OK. Let's say order 5 or 6 can be done on a laptop. But it's already pretty good. Yeah. But order 9, you have to suffer. Well, essentially, OK, exponent, exponent is exponent. There is nothing I can do about it. So essentially, yes, you, right now you say, OK, between order 5 and 9, you kill yourself for the error bar, just to be sure. Not for the result. You kill yourself for the error bar. OK, let me now kind of probably discuss some results for the Hubbard model, because that's the topic of the workshop. So I will not discuss this, because strictly speaking, OK, let me show it right away. TC here is just to be too small to be ever seen. So you say, OK, the highest TC on this plot is probably okay, 10 minus 100. So this is totally impractical. But that's the phase diagram in the ground state of the Fermi Hubbard model, square lattice in 2D. Okay. TCs in this region are extremely small. So this is BCS regime, and the coupling constant in the Cooper channel is very, very small. 
But those are the instabilities in the Fermi liquid if you can potentially go to extremely low temperature. So it's not practical, except it's telling you that you are more or less reliably for any value of u. If your density is above 0.6, it's likely to be dx squared minus y squared superconductor. So the other competing phases looks like they're all left to the left. So this is not practical. Don't worry, you will never see it experimentally. So, so sorry, I said I didn't catch uh, I mean, U of 4, N of 0.7, uh, Tc is. No, here I cannot do it. No, no, just say, okay, well, the, where you have error bars, we more or less reliably can do it. So somewhere here. Somewhere here, just don't go beyond 0.7. Somewhere here, Tc is so small, there is no hope ever. So the coupling constants which we measure here will tell you that Tc is 10 minus 100, so just don't worry. But it's very sharply increasing with u, and it's very sharply increasing with m, the coupling constant. But then we give up because our behavior is not good. So the original expansion, the way how we used it for this plot, is not working close to half So how do you get T equals 0 results from the... I think you just uh, from measuring a reducible Cooper channel coupling constant ah, and see ah. which channel is winning. So let me discuss something which was also kind of mentioned many, many times during this workshop. And typically I would see this phase diagram. Well, it's more or less, you think about high TCs. But this phase diagram was showing what's kind of given to us when people discuss two-dimensional Hubble model with T prime equals zero. So that's the most relevant model for optical lattices, T prime equals zero square lattice. So if you have T prime equals zero square lattice first, it's not a layered three-dimensional system. So there is no anti-thermagnetic phase in the first place. So forget about this one. Just don't even show it because it will never happen in the system if it's two-dimensional. Second, it's not a Coulomb system. So it cannot phase, I know, phase separate into charges. So you don't have this one. I don't mention, I know, multiband and phonons. It's okay, all right. So, but the most important changes for me, kind of, in the phase diagram is that first, anti-ferromagnetic transition comes only through weak coupling between the layers. That's why in 2D there is no anti-ferromagnetism, except in the ground state. And second, well, that's what exactly what I want to discuss, I think generically you always have phase separation when you slightly dope the system, and the temperature, as far as we can estimate now, is roughly 0.1 in units of photon. So the system will always phase separate, which means in the ground state, don't discuss Hubbard model, which is a little bit dope. I think generically it doesn't exist. It will always phase separate. Macroscopically, basically. Yeah. Do you so, mean complete phase separation or just strike, some sort of strike? That's what I will, I, I cannot say into what it will separate. It will separate into whole ridge, an ideal no holes state at zero temperature. But I cannot tell you what will be the ground state whole ridge. Can be striped, sure. Can be striped, doped with holes. As one the, of the possibilities as a result of the phase separation. Okay? But first, okay, before I discuss phase separation. Yep? Is that statement all the impact? I believe this is, no, the well, filling factor is close to half filling, you phase separate for any value of U. For large U, this was uh, like 40, 50 years ago, starting from Nagaoka and others. This was more or less convincingly shown that magnetic, thermagnetic polarons, they will coalesce. And this means that, okay, at very large U in the Nagaoka limit, you probably phase separate all this into thermagnetic region and antiferromagnet. So for large U. But for small U, okay, I'll come to this. But before I discuss phase separation, let me characterize this line. Because I think, okay, at least for the two-dimensional Hubbard model, this is not a mysterious line. This is just the line where the correlation lengths for magnetic correlations gets very, very large. Okay, large means you know, larger than atomic distance. So strong magnetic correlations develop below this dashed line, and that's what I will show you first, okay, how we characterize it. Below this, you can call it pseudo gap because now collective modes are playing the dominant role, and single particle weight is, of course, suppressed because now spin waves are the dominant excitation. So what is this line? I'll just forget about the technique. Just telling you how we characterize it, you simply do the spin-spin correlation function at zero frequency and just plot it in the brilliant zone. And whenever you see that the ratio between maximum and minimum, and I will see, well, okay, if you dope the system, the peak actually splits. Exactly at half feeling, of course, you have a peak at pi pi. But if you dope the system, the peak will split, which immediately tells you that, yes, you have some modulation of the antiferromagnetic order with some antiphase for the domain wall, so that's why it kind of it's a deep at pi pi. I'm not telling you what kind of order because typically we see them as diagonal, 
not vertical or horizontal as in the MRG studies on stripe or on elongated geometries, we see them diving. Again, the correct picture, I don't know. So we simply measure if the difference between maximum and minimum is factor of 10, I draw the dashed line. And that's more or less, okay, uh, asking the question, okay, how do we characterize when this is important? So that's more or less the plot at what temperature and at what value of U you have to worry about the magnetic correlation setting in. So typically around you know, temperature 0 0.2, 0 0.25 in units of hopping, you will start developing strong magnetic correlation. It's literally telling that if you're doing DMFT or even small cluster DMFT, it's not reliable. You have to do better. You really have to beat the correlation length by the cluster size. And already hard way, kind of as in our rule, we learned that, okay, answers which you get for clusters 8 and 16, you, for example, claim it's an insulator. 32, oh, I don't know, 64, oh, maybe a metal. 128, definitely metal. So the picture changes after the cluster size of 100. Even at half filling, this is extremely hard. But if I kind of go to the dope system, you have to be very careful. So below those dashed lines, you have to do large, large clusters just to be sure about that. Now, phase separation. Uh, probably you have to adjust to this plot, but believe me. Okay. So if I don't have phase separation, that's how constant density plots will behave <coughs> near half filling. So density close to 1, this is essentially chemical potential U divided by 2, that's particle hole symmetry. And then, essentially, at zero temperature, the chemical potential is somewhere in the gap. So this is the gap in the ground state. And then any other density has to go somehow and deep below the gap. Another density, another density. So that's the picture without phase separation when I add more and more holes, and ultimately I go from an insulator, and if I have many holes, it's kind of heavily complicated. If I have a phase separation, that's the picture which you will see. You'll see that, okay, some curves appear to cross, but if I continue them, they terminate at the first order line. Well, there is, of course, some n minus, I'll explain on the next plot, line which just hits the last point here, and the rest will be kind of femiliquid behavior, but some femiliquids can end up, which is formally inside the gap for the single hole. So the gap can be measured from a single hole. There's no phase separation for one hole. And then you introduce finite concentration, so that's the picture if you have phase separation. And, okay, just specifying, so this will determine what I call will TC. This is 1 minus NC, the critical density, which is the maximum of the dome, and this is N minus. So you separate from, at zero temperature, you separate from ideal antiferromagnet, no, no holes to whole rich region, and I am not claiming anything, what is the ground state. So maybe the stripes, dope stripes, because we do see magnetic correlations with the deeper pipeline. Okay, and this is how our data look so far. We are not finished, no archive, because we are not sure yet about all the error bars. But the answer tells us, okay, it's extremely unlikely that all of those curves somehow will end up below the gap. Yes, we have some error bar on the gap, unfortunately, it's not very precise yet. But it looks like, okay, some of the curves definitely try to cross. And it's, I would say, just even from this plot, I would say it's extremely <coughs> unlikely that we'll get you know, all the curves below the gap. So it looks like we do have phase separation, but we have to continue working. Yeah, I probably didn't mention this. Yeah, I forgot to, to mention. Okay, phase separation, of course, not something new. People were predicting phase separation from variation of Monte Carlo a long time ago. But this was oscillating, even the best so far by numbers. Auxiliary field Monte Carlo was saying phase separation, and then later they were saying none. And the problem is that in variation of Monte Carlo, you more or less always commit yourself to some nodal structure which is uniform in space. But if the space is phase separating, it wants to be non-uniform. And then the variation on that is not flexible enough to do the phase separation. What instead people see that the energy curve in the ground state has essentially zero compressibility. So you say by Maxwell construction, sometimes you can tell the phase separation. Unless the curve is absolutely linear, then the Maxwell construction and the linear curve <laughs> is the same. That's what more or less you see in the variation of Monte Carlo. And yeah, unfortunately, I have to say that some of the best Monte Carlo variationally was taking all the statements back. So that's why we have to continue this calculation. Maybe from finite temperatures, we can prove that that's the right picture. Yeah, probably this is it, except I will mention one phase diagram which was mentioned in the morning by Tillman. <coughs> yeah, it was uh, Haldane Hubbard model which means you have honeycomb lattice with uh, coupling between nearest neighbor with some phase, 
And the question was, okay, how you make transition between different topological phases? And this was done in three different ways, for, for a reason. You have three methods, but none of them is fully controlled. So if you do a mean field, that's the phase diagram. Yes, you have unusual topological transitions. Then you do exact diagonalization. It somewhat changes the topologies, and instead of one line, you just open the gap. But you can say maybe it's finite size approximation, but I'm not exactly sure how big. Then you do yet another approximation, which is DMFT. And this point, where three lines meet, this point, point just flies out. I'm not showing it because it's numerically it's not like that. So the question is, okay, well, which one is the correct one? This one, this one, or this one? Because the numbers are different by factor of five. Where this, for example, the triple transition happens, this can go on all the way up to U equals 15. Okay, so and we did kind of diagrammatic Monte Carlo for the same system, and we found that, okay, you have to go to what is at least three and higher, up to five, and this is our phase diagram. So mean field is roughly would be here, just with something. DMFT would fly out. Exact diagonalization is reasonable, except it will open as pure as and as equal one phase in the middle, but that's the correct phase diagram. And unfortunately for this type of topological phase diagrams, diagrammatic Monte Carlo is very nice because for Dirac systems, there is a finite convergence radius. So essentially, you can make those transitions very reliably. So I'll probably stop here. Questions? Um, so you showed, uh, so you discussed the fact that you can shift uh, the the origin of your series expansion. Yeah. Can you do this variationally, as was suggested in this variational perturbation theory? Oh yeah, of course, because you have infinite number of ways how you can do shifts. You can optimize how you do okay. it. It's still not a black box, but maybe for the for the uh, this was all, <coughs> yeah. I didn't mention this. It was already kind of implemented for the Coulomb gas. Yeah, because I would before I was suffering kind of our student Kun Chen and uh, Christian Howley, they actually already implemented all of this for the Coulomb gas. So yes, you can do this type of shifts, but you can also optimize them for the best convergence. Out of the mod state, fermionic mod state, say on the triangular lattice, you change the interactions. What, what, what would be a good starting point for the predictive return? Well, for example, you can definitely do diagrammatic expansion using different ways, starting from DMFT solution. Say DMFT solution gives you a mod insulator. And this can be used as a starting point to, for doing all the rest of the diagram. And this can be done in a couple of ways. Not everything was explored yet. We just did well, some Eugenic was trying to do it in a certain way, but there are many other ways how you can do it. There's also do a feminine approach, which is maybe more kind of numerically sophisticated, but it's also kind of a regular approach. You can do the same using cluster DMFT. Cluster DMFT can be used as a zero sort approximation to do the rest of the diagram. Maybe if we do it in a clever way, we can do much better in the physics of large U. So far, very large U in our own kind of methods, how we implemented them so far, we cannot do it properly. But other ways are still there, so they were not explored fully. So I believe it's doable, we just don't know yet how exactly it should be implemented for the best result. But it's doable. So the MFT, it's already kind of highly non-perturbative answer, can be used as zero point approximation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, first one, um, is this related? There is one example which I would qualify for resurgence, which happened out of the blue. Well, formally, resurgence says, okay, if I have not only Taylor series and the coupling constant, but also the log and the E minus one of the coupling constant, then probably I can reconstruct any function. And one case, which was kind of the test study by Pavel Buvidovich from Egensburg, he took a model with essential singularity, E minus 1 over G. That's the mass which is generated by the model. But then you do the shift, you introduce an artificial gap, and you start computing graphs. Some of the graphs are expansion and coupling constant because they will behave. But the infrared divergent uh, diagrams, they had logs, but the log was regularized by the artificial mass. And ultimately, he ended up with the expansion, which was Taylor series and G times additional powers of logs. And for doing nothing else, 
just like this shift. He got convergent series to the current ones. So sometimes you can reproduce resurgent series, I mean, maybe I know, not the most generic way, but by doing this type of shift. No, I know I'm not giving the full answer, but yes, we have to. If we can learn how to do all the coefficients for resurgent series, this will be great. We just don't know it yet. But I have you discussed space separation, but you didn't talk too much about uh, superfluidity in one way or another. Do, do you get a, a, a highest temperature for that? I mean, is there a. a mm, we are still working on this kind of to implement how to measure TC, okay. but not going to TC because TC can be too low and too kind of painful. But you can determine TC from the Fermi liquid regime because you know the BCS theory. I don't have to go to TC to say what it is. But I need the reduced properties and the reducible Cooper channel. And we know how to do it. Really, uh, question. I, I, I mean, you have these calculations for, uh, for the zero temperature phase diagram, and you said the gaps are very small, and you can like the U equals four maybe, and n, which was the affinity thing, which was also part of the phase diagram to show. Yeah. On the phase diagram you showed the the, the plot for T C was was a sort of a guess, right? Because no, no. This this is a cartoon. Sorry. Right. And this is a cartoon. Uh, okay. uh, this one. That, that's no, this is not the result because there are no error bars. If there are no error bars, yeah. we didn't calculate it. But so it seems to be like the cartoon said, oh, TC is just like a third of whatever the temperature. Ah, okay. But you're saying no, it's like 10 to minus 100. You know, that would be important no, for us to know. Oh, for <laughs> super, no, for superconductivity, if you dope it at the level of 40%, yes. Yeah. Don't look for superconductivity there. Yeah, sure. But if it's 10 percent, I don't know yet. We didn't calculate. That's the project which we are trying to implement now. Because now we understand all the technical details, how to do it, probably we'll be able. But. So final uh, question, Christian. I think it was the same, basically. I wanted okay, to know roughly okay. the order of the TC for the phase separation. But for TC for phase separation, I know. No, uh, he was asking for TC for superfluidity. Okay, what is the TC for phase separation? Okay, sorry. So this, yeah. From this and all the other plots, you see, okay, temperature 0.15, ah. 0.1. At 0.1 looks like we are hitting to something which is probably across. Okay. So below point one, yeah, I forgot to say, yeah, sorry. Cold atoms is ideal place to do phase separation. Come on, guys. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you do essentially nothing, and from single site imaging, you say it's there, you just see it. It's the easiest probe I can imagine for cold atoms just to see phase separation. Okay, so we'll let Richard ask the last question. Can the end function be from the setup Just, just a statement. Uh, uh, probably, probably the most reliable values for uh, D wave are the Meyer, Scalapino, DC values, and that would be. Uh, temperature about 120th of the hub. Yeah, so I will finish the question of this because everything they do in the, under the dome of magnetic correlations, and I know that clusters of bigger than 100 will be required. So I don't fully trust what they do. But yes, that's the estimate. All right, let, let's thank Nikolai again.